All right, welcome back, Duck D. Uh, it is Monday, uh, April 6th, and this will be the fourth video uh, that I'm recording uh, for, in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so I thought I would spend just a few minutes uh, right up front to kind of refresh what we talked about because that was all last week and we've all slept and had a weekend in between. And so uh, let's kind of do just a quick uh, review and uh, I'll go ahead and I'll do the slideshow just because. And we're going to go through these really, really quickly and uh, hopefully that will help us. All right, so um, some of the, t the uh, topics that we've covered, we uh, talked about, um, uh, we've been working on this definition of quality, and uh, we, in, in that same vein, we also talked about um, Crosby and his zero defect philosophy, uh, where quality uh, means conformance to requirements and not this uh, subjective term of goodness. And... Uh, quality is achieved by prevention, not appraisal. And again, um, appraisal is part of that prevention. And as we talk later on today, as we get into the new material, that will become readily apparent that um, while prevention is key, there also has to be uh, appraisal built into that. And, and you'll see that as we continue on through. All right, and then uh, quality has a performance standard of zero defects, not acceptable quality levels. And we talked about um, how the uh, airplane, you know, the, uh, the uh, airline industry, you know, if we looked at a 1% uh, defect rate that resulted in crashes, you know, how many that would be. And uh, so that obviously is not acceptable. And, and that's an extreme. And uh, so we need to keep in mind that you know, the, the goal of zero defects is not necessarily zero defects, uh, except in some extreme circumstances, such as the airline industry. And then the quality is, me uh, quality is measured by the price of non-conformance, not indexes. And we'll really kind of flesh that out today. And that, that's really um, going to be the bulk of what we talk about uh, today. So let's go on through, uh, and I'm just going to scroll through these. Uh, Crosby's 14 Steps to Creating Quality. I'm going to lecture on these on Wednesday. Uh, that'll be probably be the bulk of my, my lecture for Wednesday. So it, it <laughs> depending on how I go, I mean, you know, we're probably talking 20 to 25 minutes worth of lecture just on these 14 steps of creating quality because I think they're really important. And so everybody that graduates, um, is going to go on, you know, with a degree you would expect it, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, you're probably going to get into management at some point. And so having thought about these 14 steps to creating quality, I think will create big dividends for you later on in your life. And so hopefully um, you can take to heart some of the things that we've talked about uh, with Crosby, also with W. Edwards Deming. And, and so give you something to actually um, start with when you when you get out and you get into that first management position and you know you're trying to figure out how how does this all work how do I how do I lead people how do I manage people what is that all about how do I do it effectively uh, and so forth and so on so well again uh, my my next lecture will be over these 14 steps of creating quality um, I would imagine it'll be about 20 to the 25 minute lecture Let's see, what are we talking about here? All right, we already talked about our own um, views on what quality is. And hopefully uh, those have changed uh, for you since we first started this. All right, and then we looked at, you know, defining quality and this number one here, the characteristics of a product or service that, that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. And that's, that's really the definition that we're working for and that we're, that we're fleshing out. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about the history of quality. And uh, so, you know, uh, 
Deming developed st statistical methods that improve manufacturing quality. Uh, we talked about the transition of the Japanese uh, industrial complex and how uh, that essentially after World War II they had no industrial infrastructure left. And uh, as they started rebuilding, uh, initially, you know, what they were printing out was, was not very high quality. And uh, so, you know, at that time, uh, things that were made in J Japan were thought to be of, of low quality. All right. Uh, so we have W. Edwards Deming that then comes on the scene, and he really helped uh, the Japanese kind of kickstart their industrial development. And uh, so as that transition uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, Japanese manufacturing quality uh, really was top of the line. All right, and again, this is all just, just kind of a quick once over the world of the stuff we've already called. Uh, so we talked about uh, Philip Crosby, all right, some of the things that he did, all right, and again, Crosby's four absolutes, all right, and so, you know, these are things that you must know, all right, uh, so again, you know, if I, if I say something more than once or twice, then you, you'll probably see it again, so take heed. All right, so the definition of quality is conformance to requirements. Um, We'll have an assignment at the end of the day where we're writing requirements on something that I'm sure that each of us are intimately familiar with, the cell phone. And we'll have a secondary assignment um, next week or and probably maybe the week after because next week's pretty already full uh, where we rewrite those. All right. All right. The system of quality is prevention, not appraisal. Uh, performance standard is zero defects. We've already kind of talked about that. And then the measurement of quality is the price of nonconformance. Okay. Again, you must know these. All right. Here we go. All right. We already talked about that. Uh, we're going to talk more in depth about some of the sources of quality errors. And more importantly, we're going to talk about the cost of associated quality errors. All right. So, again, we're just rehashing. Um, the uh, the four um, principles there. Let me go back. Building quality throughout the process. Okay, and then again, as I said the other day, there there are several different quality standards or mindsets that that are out there. Uh, total quality management would be in another one. All right, let's see. <laughs> All right, so here we talked about the zero defect policy. Uh, all right, and then we talked about, uh, you know, in the airline industry, uh, you know, 0.01% uh, results in two crashes a day in Atlanta only. All right, and so that's not good enough. All right. All right, so I think this is where I ended up with my last lecture, either here or very close to here. Um, so, you know, we talked about that price of uh, nonconformance. And so here we're actually going to start to talk about the dollars and cents of it and why, um, why it costs so much and, and how we can limit that cost as well. All right, and bear with me while I spool up my other slide over here. Um, all right, there we go. Sorry, I'm working off of two different decks here. All right, so again, we're gonna we're working to uh, work on translating um, these uh, thoughts, these principles, into dollars, dollars and cents, because you know that's really where it's all about. And so, as I've said uh, numerous times that, you know, my focus is more from an industrial manufacturing standpoint than anything else. It has direct applicability to service industry as well. But again, the bulk of my experience is in the manufacturing industry. And so that's where I'm really taking my stint, um, or my viewpoint, excuse me. And so this, this, Everything, again, as I said, has direct applicability, uh, but there may be some, some slight differences between. All right, so let's go on. Quality is free, or it should be. All right. Um, 
So again, this is not, you know, just a 100% a accurate statement because quality isn't free. It costs money. But if we invest that money right up front, all right, and we have a system that addresses quality from the very beginning all the way from our suppliers all the way through to transit to the end user and even after that um, then it, it really is free because it's already developed and so there's not extra money diverted to quality okay uh, it is nonconformance that costs nonconformance costs a lot of money all right and so our next slide that we'll look at after this uh, we talk about what it costs to fix defects depending upon where we're at in the production cycle or, or production slash development cycle all right uh, it's not cheaper to make 100 parts and throw 10 away all right it is it's it's less expensive to make 100 parts right the first time and so that i mean that whole statement right there probably sums this, sums this up in its entirety in that if I develop quality in from the very beginning it costs a little bit more to create those parts but if we amortize that cost out over two to three million or hundred million parts it becomes pennies on the dollar and maybe not even pennies all right uh, and so that if we're doing this from the start and we're catching uh, errors, sources of errors before they become a problem all right, we're not throwing away extra money and so you know if we look at uh, if we make a hundred parts without uh, quality management or they heaven forbid should our, our quality management slips and they make it through and we have to throw 10 away well you know there's 10 percent that's a 10 percent loss right off the right off the whip stitch all right and so very very quickly it becomes very expensive all right, uh, an investment in improving quality pays itself back, uh, and, and that's especially true when you look at uh, if we are doing this over the duration of a manufacturing cycle, a lifetime cycle for a particular part, uh, you know, which uh, for manufacturing, you know, the latest generation iPhone, you know, well, we're going to manufacture those for two years, but we're going to make billions of the darn things um, then you know again if we build our quality in right up front and we're catching that we're catching the errors before they get out all right it, it literally costs pennies um, to have uh, a product that meets requirements and, and is conformant all right so let's go to our next slide here all right and this next slide talks about what it costs to fix defects all right, and so, you know, what does that mean? One second. So this is looking at a production cycle. And so, you know, that we have four different um, phases here, so to speak. And, and some of the, and literally, depending upon how you looked at this, there might be up to six or seven, maybe even more phases, all right? But this is just a, a rough... Uh, a rough paintbrush looking at this so in the initial design phase all right when we're creating a product all right it literally costs nothing to make changes to fix errors to do whatever all right because we're, we're doing that exploratory stage we're putting together ideas and we're looking at how they relate to each other uh, you know, we're looking at big picture things and then working our way down, as you recall. And so to find something that um, is out of conformance there literally costs nothing. All right. If we go on to the next stage, so now we've, we've built um, an ideal and we're starting to uh, develop that product. And so we're making actual parts together that go together and work together, uh, but in limited numbers. All right. Uh, so... Again, this is we're still in that uh, prototyping stage. We're developing it, and we're creating a workable model at this point. All right, and so at this stage, to find you know a defect or a non-conformant item, the cost is roughly 6.5 times. All right, so might as well say seven times the cost to fix it. So 
it's it's quite a bit more expensive, but it's still in the realm of you know okay okay this is this is doable, and this is really an expected cost, because when we're doing this development thing, we we might have up to, well, we'll have several different models that we're working concur concurrently that we're developing to see which one is going to work out the most, and that can actually tree out uh, what we have you know, maybe four or five major prototypes, and then with each of those major prototypes, maybe we have trees of sub-prototypes within those that are addressing sub-requirements, all right? And, and so that kind of goes beyond the, the nature of what we're talking about here. If I actually had a uh, chalkboard, uh, this would be one that would be useful, I think, to, to throw out there. But anyhow, it really exceeds what we need to talk about, so we'll move on. All right, so then we move on to testing. So we've we've settled on, you know, hey, we like this prototype. It meets the requirements that we have, that, or at least we think that it does. And now we're doing extensive testing. And so, you know, you've probably all heard of uh, beta testing before. And so here we, we create a limited number of products, and then we're sending those outside. Well, we, we, we might be testing them internally first, and, and then, you know, a, as we as we fix things and, and think that we have a much more workable model, uh, then we'll start beta testing them outside of uh, our industrial complex. And so the cost there gets a little bit more expensive. And it's still, you know, it's not an, ex an exorbitant cost, you know, 15 times the cost to fix it from if I'd found the issue in design stage, uh, roughly double what it would fix, cost to fix it in a development stage. But still, it's not, it's still it's not an exorbitant cost and, and really it's it's kind of an expected cost because we expect to find issues and errors things that we need to correct in the testing that's that's why it's testing all right now if we look at the curve and and so here we are in testing and now we get to the de de deployment all right so here we've done all this testing and we've made the tweaks that we think are going to be good and we send it out and then we realize boom that we missed we missed something big all right well, the cost is a hundred times more and, and I think that's a conservative cost depending upon what it is all right but so it's exponentially more expensive uh, once it gets to that deployment stage and so that's why this whole total quality man this whole quality management not total quality management the whole quality management ideal is so important is that the sooner that we catch an issue the less money it costs to fix. All right, and that's what this whole thing boils down to is that the sooner that we catch an issue or a potential issue and we can make take corrective actions, it costs much, much less money. All right, so let's go on. Whoop. All right. All right, quality is free, or it should be. Um, quality is relative to the maturity of the technology and the processes, all right? Um, and so here, you know, it just talks a little bit about uh, the realism of, you know, especially in new technology, all right? So some new designs take a while to find all the problems, especially if we're exploring new technology. We don't even know what we don't know, all right? Um, you may never make enough to guarantee the process. Yeah, so, yeah, there, I mean, there's no, there are no absolutes. You, you can't guarantee that you're going to be able to catch everything. All right. And then, you know, this last little bullet, this is so true, you know, especially that price of nonconformance, and we start looking about at, you know, if we, if we are sending out a product and it is nonconformant, all right, we need to have super, super, uh, customer service so that you know we can handle their problems in, in a constructive way and an expedient way all right and make them feel like they're still a winner uh, out of this even though you know they got a part that didn't meet their requirements all right, all right let's see here all right the cost of quality so as you probably have starting to guess creating a zero defect system with its um, system of prevention as well as appraisal costs money all right and, and we're going to talk about what those costs are 
All right. So get these all up here. The cost of having a zero defect system. All right. So the apprent prevention costs incurred through from marketing through to, and actually it's even through design uh, includes process improvement and cost stemming from appraisal. All right. So again, this is that whole. We're looking at this from a systemic view from our suppliers all the way through delivery to make sure that uh, the product that the customer buys gets there unharmed and meets the stated requirements. Okay, and so those requirements are things that we state that it must do. And it, it, so the prevention cost, again, systemic from the beginning all the way through the end. And then appraisal cost, and again, these, these are, they go hand in hand. You must have the the overall preventative uh, thought process in mind, all right? But you also have to have appraisal in there as well. And again, we talked about uh, all the different things that go into that, you know, so such as you know, tool wear, machine wear, human error, um, defects in the material that you uh, initially got, so forth and so on. All right. The cost of nonconformance or not having a zero defects philosophy. Uh, we have internal failure costs, which include scrap, rework, process failure, downtown, and downtime, not downtown, and price reductions. All right. And so let me talk a little bit about this downtime. Um, a lot of these factories, um, downtime costs them thousands of dollars per hour. All right. When they look at, uh, you know, so there's a, a say a machine goes down and because that machine is down uh, maybe that's the one machine that does that process and so everything comes to a screeching halt it literally can cost thousands and thousands and, and even into the tens of thousands of dollars per hour and so not having this zero defect policy in that you know we, we are continually checking we are continually implementing improvements and we're continually looking for better ways to do things can cost a lot of money all right external failure costs so it difference between internal versus external of course internal happens within the house all right so we have issues that happen in-house during manufacturing external failure costs all right means that hey it got out to the public and so now we have people who've paid for a product and it's not meeting their needs. So we have complaints, returns, warning claims, liability, lost sales. Um, and then, you know, we also have this huge hit to um, our reputation. All right, so we talk, uh, let's talk about actual prevention costs. All right, so we have quality planning costs, all right? And so this is, again, what does it cost to actually implement this from the very beginning? And it does cost. And, and it, it is expensive, but, if it's, again, if it's, as I said, if it's amortized out over the production cycle of that product, it literally becomes pennies. All right. Um, so product design costs. All right. And so here, we're again, we're looking at the design process and how do we make sure that we design it to... The requirements all right if it's not designed to meet requirements all right then we're, we're going to be non-conformant we'll likely be non-conformant process cost uh, cost expended to make sure productivity process conforms to quality specifications and so we have prevention as well as uh, some appraisal costs built into that which we'll talk about next um, training cost so again you know this is a mindset within the company if we go back to w edwards dimming and you know the uh, unified uh, goals for the company all right so we're training everybody so we have to train the workers uh, we have to train the supervisors all the way up so that everybody has this unified view and this unified goal all right and then information costs um, you know, and, and these information costs really are, are an overhead, you know, because we have to um, 
we develop a lot of data through this process and we need to be able to store that data and manage that data and uh, access that data and so huge amount of overhead just in managing the data from from this whole process all right and so a lot of times especially if you have a government contract you know they want to see the data on the whole on that whole product process all right they want to see what you're doing how you're doing it they want to see what the non-conformance rate is in, in an actuality on, on a lot of government contracts they will specify that you know hey you must have a non-conformance rate of this or less all right so very 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 common to see that and so it costs a lot of money to maintain that data and manage that data because you have to have people number one that are taking the data you have to have people that are storing the data you have to have people who are doing analytics on the data all right and then you know you're going to then transmit that information to the end user which might be internal it may be external all right but so information cost well you might think uh, initially you know that's a pretty small cost um, it's significant and I would say it's probably roughly 25 percent uh, of your costs are going to be developed on information costs all right let's see where are we at next um, appraisal cost so this is all prevention and this again you know this is developing that mindset from the very beginning going from uh, where we're sourcing materials from to delivery to of the end product to the customer all right so very large process cost a lot of money to implement but again if we do it right up front uh, it's already built in and literally over the life cycle of a product it costs pennies per product all right so appraisal costs so as I've stated several times you know with this prevented with this prevention uh, zero defects prevention policy in place we still have to have appraisal to check uh, to make sure that we're, we're maintaining and we're also looking for all those different things that can cause failure or non-conformance all right so inspection and testing all right so this is significant also in that for this inspection and testing we actually have to develop uh, methods for testing we have to develop tools to actually test with all right and it's typically called gauging um, and so and then of course you know we're going to generate uh, a lot of data from the inspection and testing that goes right back into that preventative cost uh, on information and so this is another portion of that because we're going to do all this testing and we're going to record the data if we don't record the data then it's all for naught all right uh, other than you know the the feel good that oh yeah we're 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 still within meeting our requirements we're still conformant but by um, taking all these measurements and reporting all these measurements and recording them and analyzing them we can see trends and we can start to see uh, when our part quality starts to drift and then we can take uh, corrective actions at that point uh, test equipment cost again I already just talked about that um, you know so typically on you know any industrial complex you know, you're going to have uh, an entire department that is labeled as quality control all right and so those folks come out and they are going to be intimately familiar with each piece of machinery um, that's producing parts in the, in the whole process uh, they'll know um, how many parts an hour it does on average what the max is what the min is um, and they'll have a whole um, stockpile of data about what the norm coming off of that machine is so you know uh, they'll have a range of you know measurements or, or whatever that, that says you know hey this particular machine um, is capable of producing parts within this range all right and then you know of course we have um, operator costs so we, we've, we've got all that we've got the inspection and testing program we're developing the test equipment uh, and then we have to train somebody to actually do that stuff and then they have to go and do it all right so again you know a lot of money spent on, on this appraisal cost as well all right 
Uh, internal failure cost, and again, you know, so this is something that uh, we uh, experience a failure during the manufacturing process. All right. So the scrap cost, you know, if you've got a part that is not conformant, um, in some cases, you know, it's, it's so far out that we can't bring it back into conformance and it becomes scrap. And so that scrap cost can be very, very expensive in that um, we lose the cost of what we would have earned for selling one complete unit. And, and in actuality, we've made, we're now making at least two units for that same cost. <laughs> All right. So very, very expensive. Rework cost. So if we make a part that's out of conformance uh, and, we, and we find that, in some instances, we can rework that. All right. So here the cost is not quite as much because we're still taking the initial material that came in and we're just reworking it. But the cost of machining time on that can be quite expensive. Uh, upwards of $100 an hour. And so depending upon um, what has to be reworked, that, that can be very, very uh, expensive. Uh, process failure cost. Um, so this is, again, you know, it goes with uh, those people who are intimately familiar with the machines and the processes and trying to figure out what particular thing has caused this, this failure or this drift uh, from our manufacturing standard, all right? Process downtime cost, and again, as I said earlier, um, for some factories, it's literally tens of thousands of dollars per hour that they're down, and so they 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 avoid that at all costs, all right? And then price down creating cost, um, if we have a uh, product that doesn't meet conformance, um, so in some cases. Uh, you can buy a second, a factory second, which means that, you know, it'll still probably do the job, but it doesn't actually meet um, the specified requirements. And so uh, in some cases, you know, you, you're not capable of having uh, factory seconds, uh, but in other cases you can, you know, if you think about um, some of the discount shoe outlets and whatever, uh, the shoes that are coming in there are factory seconds, meaning that, uh, when they went through that uh, quality control process, uh, they were found to be wanting. Uh, but, you know, they're saving from just scrapping them, and they're, you know, so they're selling them as a factory second. All right. External failure costs are, you know, and so this is uh, addressing materials that uh, actually leave your factory and they get out to... Um, to the public. All right, so customer complaint cost. Um, yeah, so again, if you think about, you know, and Amazon is a place that comes to mind right off the bat. You know, if you get a product that uh, got there and you know it it doesn't meet what you expected you know you can call Amazon and say nah I don't like this and you know they'll they'll say okay well we'll replace it and so you know they'll ship you a, well uh, they'll they'll send you a return authorization code and you ship it back and they ship you a new product right well depending upon what type of system you're in all right so you buy a widget from company X and you know you are finding that you know the widget doesn't work the way that it's supposed to, all right. So company X has to, you know, start an investigative process. Okay, why? Well, they, I shouldn't say they don't have to. If they have uh, some type of quality management program, they will, uh, you know, because they're going to find out. Okay, what exactly is wrong with our product? Uh, and then we're going to look at where did that error occur? All right. So we have to. Take, we have to gather information from the customer. Um, sometimes we'll actually have the part sent back to us so that we can examine the part to say, okay, um, you know, is this just an erroneous complaint or is it really that our product um, didn't, didn't meet the requirements, all right? So we got cost of handling. Uh, so, you know, 
shipping and postage is expensive anymore. Um, depending upon what you're shipping, you know, it, it can cost, you know, 40 or $50 on up to thousands of dollars, you know, if we're, if we're returning something large, a large piece of machinery. Um, product return, you know, so um, if the customer says, hey, I don't like this, you know, ideally you would think that we would say, okay, um, we're going we're gonna to make it right, we're going to replace that. All right, so we have warranty claim costs. Um, you know, we specify that it will do this, and if it doesn't, then we'll replace it or we'll make it right, what, whatever. Um, product liability costs. All right, so in our litigious society that we live in, um, you can sue anybody for anything. And so uh, if we are selling a product and we're making claims that it will do X, Y, and Z, it had better do X, Y, and Z. If not, um, it is very likely that uh, we could actually be sued. And even if the suit is frivolous, um, very, very expensive to do. You know, the, the average attorney runs at about $250 an hour here locally. Uh, if you get to uh, large metropolitan areas, that jumps to four to $500 an hour just to find somebody who is competent. Uh, lost sales costs, uh, and again, this has just relates directly back to our uh, reputation. You know, if we have a good reputation, uh, we're going to be able to sell products. Uh, if our reputation starts to suffer, then we're not going to get repeat buys. We're not going to get referrals to other people. And so the net result of that is that we're not selling as many products. All right, let's see. We'll talk about um, how do we make mistakes? All right, so where do these mistakes happen? All right, and these are all human errors right here that we're looking at. All right, so mistakes are caused from se uh, several factors, lack of knowledge, lack of at attention, lack of equipment. All right, and so again, with the whole thought that we want to have this quality management from the very beginning, all the way from our supplier through delivery to the end product, all right? So we have to make sure that everybody involved, again, going back to W. Edwards Deming and that unified vision, all right? Everybody must know their place and they must have that unified vision for producing a quality product, all right? Uh, lack of attention, you know, and again, this is, this is probably the one thing that um, managers and leaders have been trying to deal with uh, since the dawn of time is that we have somebody who does one particular thing day in and day out and so you know it just becomes muscle memory and they're really not paying attention to what they're doing all right and so how do we address that well I mean there's a lot of different things that uh, have been tried and and that you can do but you know it, it's something that you're going to struggle with no matter what is that you know the lack of attention all right lack of equipment all right, uh, trying to get by with substandard equipment or trying to make an, a piece of equipment do something that it's not designed to do. And, and you see this a lot in that, you know, they, they, we might explore a product and we can make it marginally so with what we have versus spending half a million, excuse me, half a million dollars on a new piece of equipment. Well, when, when we make those type of sacrifices, um, it, it, it is a sacrifice because it's not going to create as good of a product um, and so you know again we're going to wind up with non-conformance issues more than likely I mean not, not always but you know so lack of equipment is a management problem absolutely um, you cannot expect people to um, to create good quality um, products on substandard equipment all right and, and that whole lack of equipment also goes into equipment maintenance and making sure that we have equipment that is well maintained and works all right uh, and I, I will say uh, on that lack of attention uh, must be corrected by the person itself um, through an acute reappraisal of his moral values all right and again you know this really is something that people have been battling with since the dawn of time you know, how do I keep Johnny focused on what he's supposed to be doing instead of daydreaming about what he's going to do after he gets off work? 
you know, and, and so really, I mean, it, it is a it is a personal thing within within that person. It's an intrinsic thing with that person. There are some things that we as managers can do to help address that, but you know, again, it it, it, go, it boils down to that person, and, and so you know, this is. If you, if you figure out the magic formula for this, uh, you will live a very good life because you're going to be very well paid <laughs> to do what you do. All right, let's see. Let's go on here to the next. Oh, we got a couple of cartoons here. <laughs> so, quality is our top priority. Is it more important than safety? Hmm. <laughs> All right, and the overall gist of this is that, you know, as as a manufacturer, as a producer of products or services, um, we are always doing a juggling act. Where do we spend um, our assets and resources wisely? And so, you know, we want to be uh, cost efficient. Um, we want to produce quality products. We want to have a safe environment. If employees aren't safe, um, then you know how are they how are they supposed to create quality when they're worried about their own safety? Uh, you know, being able to juggle these and, and as the, as the process goes, you know, these will rise in prominence or uh, need for resources, and it, it's never ending and and it's always changing. All right, where are we at on time here? All right, 41 minutes. Good deal. All right, so let's move on. Oh, yeah, the Apple iPhone. Woo! All right, what is quality in a smartphone? So what we're moving into here is our assignment, uh, which I set for, I think, next Wednesday. All right. Um, All right, so this is something that we're all probably very familiar with in that uh, a cell phone. And we probably all each have um, a favorite, you know, whether you're an iPhone person, Android, maybe a track phone, I don't know. Um, so, you know, as a consumer, uh, as a consumer, wow. As a consumer, what is your measurement of non-conformance cost? All right, and, and so we've got some things here. Cost of foam versus plan plus warranty. Uh, cost of the hassle of living with or fixing the problem. You know, and, and so I'm uh, very vocal about, you know, every time that, I, that the iPhone does an update, you know, stuff is broken, and then you get an immediate re update, another update, and, you know. So, you know, are they having the same problem with Android? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, so... You know, it's something that I live with. I like my iPhone. I, I, I've had one for several years. And so, you know, it's just one of those things that I've kind of been adapted to is that, you know, whenever there's an update, I expect things to not work. All right. Um, okay. So some things to think about. And then let's go ahead and let's move into... our homework whoops wrong way so this is what I want you to do uh, write down seven requirements you need your cell phone all right what is it specifically that you need your phone to do all right and then we want to be able to write those in a way that is measurable all right um, one of our next uh, lectures will be writing good requirements uh, actually it'll be after I talk about the 14 principles um, from Crosby. All right, and then so once you figured out what those requirements are, and again, try to think outside the box. Think about uh, what are your requirements that might be different from other people. All right, and, and you know, obviously, we've got a fairly small pool, so there's going to be a lot of overlap in requirements. But try to think of uh, at least a few of these that. Um, 
would be different from everybody else's. We're also going to rank those from, on a, from a, one, a 1 to a 5, being 5 being the highest, uh, of the importance. All right. And then for each of those requirements, describe the cost of nonconformance. You know, how do you measure it? Um, and then, you know, what is the cost uh, of associated with not meeting that requirement? All right. Well, I hope that everybody is staying well and that uh, you're making constructive use of your time and that I hope that uh, the message that uh, I'm sending is good for you and that, that we're meeting your needs. Um, anyhow, Doc D out, and I will see you again on Wednesday.